Hi folks, and welcome to this morning's program brought to you by Still Pond and Betterton United Methodist Churches. This is Pastor Bill with a reminder of our Sunday morning worship times. Betterton Church service starts at 9 a.m. and Still Pond Church service begins at 10.30 a.m. We hope you can find some time to join us for worship in our sanctuaries, but if you're unable to do so, we invite you to check out our website, stillbetterchurch.org, for a video of today's broadcast, as well as an archive of over 80 programs recorded in the past year and a half. On that webpage, you will also find a convenient online option for your church giving, or you can continue to mail your gifts through the post office. Either way, we are grateful for your offerings, and we thank you for your kind participation in our ministries. It's just a couple other reminders for you. AA continues to meet at Still Pond Church at 7 o'clock every Thursday evening. And the Betterton Youth Group meets on selected Friday evenings from 6.30 to 8 p.m. Give me a holler if you'd like to learn more about these or other ministries that we have provided our churches. I wanted to thank Justin Bitter for filling in for me while I was recovering from surgery last weekend. It's comforting to know that our churches are full of folks like Justin who will step up to the plate at a moment's notice to serve God. And with that in mind, next week during Sunday morning's worship services, we will be honoring those who have faithfully served in our church families. We will also be introducing and installing our new trustees for each church during that same ceremony. Please make every effort to join us in our sanctuaries to experience this blessing next week. And may the Lord bless all of you for the things that you do in the Lord's service. And now, let's begin this morning's program with a word of prayer, shall we? From the Book of Common Prayer, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, it is your will to restore all things to Christ, whom you have anointed priest forever and ruler of creation. Grant that all the people of the earth, now divided by the power of sin, may be united under the glorious and gentle rule of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. We ask this in Jesus' name, who taught us to say when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For those of you joining me in your Bibles at home, I ask that you turn to the book of Hebrews in chapter 6, and we're going to read from verse 19 through the end of the chapter into chapter 7, verse 3. Again, that's Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 through chapter 7, verse 3. It's a short passage. <clears throat> and as we continue our journey through the book of Hebrews, today we're going to learn that Christ is our high priest forever in the priestly order of a mysterious man named Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Let's discover what this means as we begin from reading from chapter 6, verse 19, where it reads, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hoop that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, and to him Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also the king of Salem, that is, the king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. From the lyrics by Henry F. Light, let us pray. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to the throne thy tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, evermore God's praises sing. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise the everlasting King. Amen. Unlike the many characters of the Old Testament that we already know about, you know, Adam, Eve, 
Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Ruth, Joseph, Esther, and Daniel. Melchizedek is a name that practically goes unnoticed. Perhaps because his name is so difficult to pronounce. Or maybe it's just because he's only mentioned in the Bible three times, one here today. And rather than having some grandiose story profoundly echoing what, what, who he was and what he did, we barely get a whisper of his existence. But boy, this story is truly important for the destiny of mankind. In today's passage, the author notes that Christ is a high priest forever. A Jewish high priest was the only man who could enter the Holy of Holies, the innermost sanctum of the temple, to atone for the sins of Israel. This was continuously practiced every year because, let's face it, no one is without sin, not even the chosen people of God. We all fall short of the glory of the Lord. When the high priest entered that room, he passed through a curtain. And according to the Mosaic Law, this was the only place that man could approach God. And it was restricted to a priest who could face his, trace his lineage back to Aaron, Moses' brother. All priests must be Levites, or of the Israeli tribe of Levi, the third eldest of Jacob's twelve sons. But we know from the Christmas story that Joseph and Mary must return to their ancestral hometown of Bethlehem to be counted and to pay their Roman taxes. Bethlehem is in the region of Judea, which is the land set aside for the tribe of Judah, the fourth son of Jacob. That being said, and according to the law of Moses, Jesus would not qualify to be a priest for the nation of Israel. Christ is proclaimed to be the high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And this fulfills David's prophecy of the coming Messiah, written in Psalm 110, where he writes, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, who was this mysterious man named Melchizedek? And what is his story? First, I want to give you a little bit of historical background. In Genesis chapters 13 and 14, we learn that 500 years before Moses led the Israelites out of the Egyptian, out of the Egyptian, Egyptian slavery, and his nephew Lot were... <clears throat> pardon me. Let me repeat. <laughs> we learn that 500 years before Moses led the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery and laid down the laws to govern the nation... Abraham, whose name was Abram at the time, and his nephew Lot were moving their families and flocks into the lower region of current-day Israel. The land could not support all of the animals of both families, so at the southern edge of the mountain range that separated Canaan from Moab, Abram gave his nephew first choice of which way to go, northwest towards the Mediterranean Sea or northeast towards the Dead Sea. And Lot chose to move his flocks and family to the lower region surrounding the Dead Sea, and he settled in the city of Sodom. Abram, Abram moved his flocks and his family on the western side of the mountain range and settled by the Oaks of Mamre, near Bethel. Both men were strangers moving into unknown territories. Where Abram lived peaceably with the inhabitants of Canaan, Lot had moved into a region where the people were known for their wicked and ungodly behavior. Soon after they had settled down, a combined army of four kingdoms from the far east, led by King Kedorlaomer, was sweeping down the Jordan Valley towards the five cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Zor. And the men from these five kingdoms could not withstand the onslaught of Kedorlaomer's army. And their cities were pillaged, and the people were taken hostage, including Lot and his family. One person who had escaped the battle traveled through the mountainous region towards Canaan to tell Abram that his nephew had been taken captive. Abram, being a devoted kinsman, he called 318 men who were in his service together to pursue Kedorlaomer. They traveled northward and caught up with them one night near Mount Hermon. And Abram divided the 318 men into groups and they attacked the army of four kingdoms, defeating them 
and chasing them another 30 miles towards Damascus. The multitude of the liberated people, as well as their possessions, were brought back towards their homeland with Abram leading the way. Let me read to you from Genesis 14 what happens next. After his return from the defeat of Kedarlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet Abram at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and he said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. To put this into perspective, let's remember that Abram and only 318 men fought and defeated an army of four kingdoms. I mean, this victory could only have happened by the grace and by the power of God Almighty. From the passage of Hebrews we had read earlier, we learned that Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness, and that he is the king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Now, Salem is the ancient name for the city of Jerusalem, and along the east side of that city is the valley of Jehoshaphat, which we call now the Kidron Valley. And this is the valley that separates the Mount of Olives from the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus crossed this valley several times in the days before he was betrayed and crucified. South of the city is the Valley of Hinnom, or what is known today as Gehenna Valley. A few months back, we spoke of this region as being the place where ancient Jews who had worshipped Molech would bring their children to be executed on an altar to this false god of the Moabite people. Because of this wickedness, the name Gehenna is appropriate for this region, because in the Greek, Gehenna means hell. The Kidron Valley and the Gehenna Valley intersect almost outside the southeast corner of Jerusalem, previously known as Salem. And this intersection is known as the Valley of Shava, the same place where Melchizedek brought bread and wine to the victorious Abram and to the multitude of people who had followed him there. The prophet Joel spoke of this area in chapter 3 when he writes, Multitudes, multitudes in the Valley of Decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the Valley of Decision. If we go back to the earlier account in Genesis, we learn why this place is called the Valley of Decision. After Melchizedek blesses God and Abram, the king of Sodom, this is what it reads, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours. Abram, an honorable man, stands in the valley of decision with two kings. One of the kings, Melchizedek, brings gifts of bread and wine, and then he blesses Abram. The other king, the one from Sodom, brings nothing but a proposition. Give me the persons, and you keep their possessions. The Hebrew word for persons is nephesh, which has a root meaning of anything that breathes. So the king of Sodom, he wants the people and the livestock. But here's the funny thing. You see, Abram, for all intents and purposes, already has the people and the possessions. They followed him to this valley of decision. Before he could reveal his humble servant of God character to this wicked king of Sodom, this king tries to bargain with Abram, offering no blessing whatsoever, and not even a thank you for saving his kingdom. Perhaps we should examine the meaning behind the name of Sodom's king. His name is Bera, which in the Hebrew means B-E, Be, son, Ra, evil. So essentially his name means the son of evil. And we know from later chapters in Genesis that God eventually destroys the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and sulfur raining down from heaven for their wickedness. This pretty much affirms why the king of Sodom 
is named the son of evil. And in this valley of decision, Abram is faced with two choices, accepting the blessing of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, or bargain with Bera, the son of wickedness. Abram, the humble servant of God, receives the blessing and refuses to bargain with the king of Sodom. 4,000 years later, <laughs> that symbolism rings true for us today. Haven't we all entered the valley of decision with a choice between good and evil, between righteousness and wickedness? How many times has the devil, the prince of darkness, mind you, tried to bargain with us? Like I mentioned earlier, the term persons, nephish, was what the king of Sodom was bargaining with Abram for. That term nephish also means souls. Satan comes to us with empty hands promising we can keep our earthly goods if only we give him our nephesh, our souls. But Jesus, our high priest forever, follows the example of Melchizedek. He brings a blessing of praise for our obedience to God's calling and he brings a blessing to God Almighty who delivers us from the hands of our enemy, the devil. Christ brings salvation for the souls standing in the valley of decision. And when Christ the King comes to receive us, he brings the gifts of grace and pardon by the sacrifice of his body and the shedding of his blood. Reminiscent of the Last Supper, Jesus gives us bread and wine to remember that sacrifice and to honor the Father who redeems our souls into the kingdom of righteousness. Let us pray. Father God, we stand in the valley of decision. Should we follow Christ or should we follow our own earthly desires? There's always a struggle to know what true salvation looks like. Too many kings of this world will point us towards eternal destruction. Lord, may your spirit guide our steps into the valley of righteousness to follow the king of creation, to know the everlasting peace that is beyond our human understanding, and to follow our one true high priest forever, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his holy name. Amen. Today's closing thought. The next time you are on the internet, launch the mapping service Google Earth Pro and search for Gay Ben Hinnom Street in Jerusalem. This modern day road runs right through the middle of the Valley of Hinnom, the, the Valley of Hell, Gehenna, that we spoke of earlier. The aerial imagery of this desolate area was taken just last April in last year, but the street view photographs from 10 years ago show little to no change. Plastic bags, abandoned vehicles, tires, and other trash litter both sides of that road. Where Palestinians and Jews constantly argue over what land in Israel is rightfully theirs to develop, this area south of Jerusalem appears to be abandoned to the garbage of mankind. Everyone knows the history of wickedness that lingers in the dust of this valley, and it seems no one wants any part of it. All humanity stands in a valley of decision. We, we could choose Christ, the King of Righteousness, the Prince of Peace, and follow him to eternal life with God in heaven. Or, or we can bargain with the devil and choose the things of this world, the spoils of an earthly life that will soon be scattered along the highway to hell. In the Gospel of Matthew Jesus said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy and where thieves will break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Friends, I beg of you, do not make a deal with the devil. His promises are as empty as his hands. But receive the gift of salvation promise through Christ Jesus. And as you lead the valley of decision, encourage others to join in the journey that leads to the kingdom of God. They, they are the real treasures that are stored up in heaven. 
We hope you can join us for worship in our sanctuaries, but if you can't, we'd like to invite you to tune in next Sunday morning at 8 a.m. for another broadcast. And until then, go in peace, and may the peace of God go with you. Amen.